In the year 50 BC, under the watchful eye of Julius Caesar, you play as a Roman agent, expanding your network of power by overthrowing cities across the map. But all roads lead to Rome, and if your competitors contributed to any specific route, they'll take a hefty share of your rewards. Will you win the favour of your leader by expanding Caesar's empire? Of course, we all know there's one small village of indomitable Gauls holding out against the invaders. Asterix and Obelix have been tasked with obtaining resources from neighbouring Roman camps. Roll dice and spend them to travel between locations and bash Romans. You might need to drink a little magic potion if you're going to enter the most fortified camps. Unless, of course, Obelix is in tow. There's no Roman legion that he can't take on. Deliver items to the villages, destroy pirate ships, and hunt wild boar to earn the most victory points in Asterix and Obelix The Big Adventure. I'm Adam Porter. I design games, and I review them on this channel with a focus on product design. If you like what I do, please subscribe and share the channel with your gaming friends. Caesar's Empire is a 2022 release from Holy Grail Games, designed by Mathieu Povedin and suitable for ages 10 and up, though I think you could probably go a little bit lower than that. The game is playable by 2 to 5 players in 30 to 60 minutes, and crucially, it's available in English, unlike Asterix and Obelix The Big Adventure which was released in 2016 by Pegasus Spieler, but only ever received a German release. If you can find a copy though, fear not. There's no text in the game aside from titles of cards and locations, and there's an English rules translation on BoardGameGeek. The game is designed by Michael Rieneck, respected designer of Cuba and Pillars of the Earth, and it's playable by two to four players aged eight and up in 40 to 60 minutes. Now I'm aware that it might be a struggle to get hold of the big adventure. I picked it up on a trip to Nuremberg a few years ago. But Caesar's Empire is widely available right now, and I wanted to contrast these two wildly different approaches to interpreting the same source material. Aside from these two, the majority of Asterix games have been makeovers of existing bestsellers. Labyrinth, Risk, Top Trumps and Mau Mau, a really popular German card game similar to Uno. I should clarify that Caesar's Empire is actually a reworking of an earlier title, which had the same Roman setting, just without the Asterix branding. But since the original game is pretty obscure, and the theme is essentially unchanged, it doesn't feel like the cash grab that we see in the other titles mentioned. In Caesar's Empire, you control a single colour representing legions in the Roman army. On your turn, you place one, two, or occasionally more legions onto the board to connect to a city, always ensuring there's an unbroken chain extending all the way back to Rome. Each player who has legions in that chain receives one victory point per legion. The player who placed their legion receives the city token and the resource which has been placed on it. If that resource was a coin, then all players receive double points for each legion in the chain. And once all cities are connected to Rome, players receive points for sets of matching resources, sets of differing resources, and for coins. They also receive points equal to the highest valued city they occupied in each colour. The highest scorer wins. The board has a map for four to five players on one side, and a map for two to three players on the reverse, with very slightly altered scoring for the cities. In Asterix and Obelix, the big adventure, Players attempt to score victory points in various ways, completing objective cards, supplying goods to villagers, defeating Romans and pirates, or gathering wild boar. On your turn, you roll the coloured dice, and you can select a die and then use its colour to take you to the corresponding Roman camp, or you can go to the Gauls' village for free. If you go to a Roman camp, you can spend further dice to beat up Romans, each of which rewards you with victory points or resources. Each Roman card has a defence value, and spending a Path die gives you one attack. Spending an Asterix result does similar, though if you also flip your magic potion, Asterix can defeat a Roman card of any value. An Obelix result is rarer, but it can bash any Roman without the need for magic potion. Asterix can also be used as a spy, allowing you to peek at the underside of three face-down cards. If you're in the village, you can spend a wild boar die to gain victory points. And of course, a die with a coin gives you extra money to spend. And this can be used after defeating Romans to purchase items at the camps. These can then be used in the village to fulfil objective cards and gain points. Finally, the dogmatics result can be spent 
to re-roll any remaining unspent dice. At the end of each round, players take turns to roll the black dice in the hope of rolling an obelix. This allows them to sink a pirate ship, gaining additional rewards. After eight complete rounds, the highest scorer wins. Let's start, as usual, with outward appearances. The starting point in the onboarding process is always the title and the cover art. The Big Adventure has such nostalgic cover art, I couldn't help but get drawn in. I've been a fan of Asterix my whole life, and while I don't often dip into the books these days, whenever I do, I find my childhood comes flooding back. Once I get past the nostalgia rush, though, I do think the game box has a few shortcomings. Firstly, the image is not very dynamic. It's just a group portrait. There's no indication of any story or action. Secondly, the title of the game is bland. Asterix books and films tend to have evocative titles. Asterix and the Secret Weapon. Asterix the Mansions of the Gods. Frankly, every Asterix story is a big adventure, so this title tells me nothing. I love the cover image to Caesar's Empire. Julius Caesar looms large and looks so cunning. It's a bold choice to acquire the Asterix license and then theme the game around his enemy. Cassinian Uderzo's Caesar is not as iconic a villain as Darth Vader or Thanos, so I can't imagine him being a major commercial draw. Yet for those of us who are deeply attached to the Asterix lore, Caesar's image is instantly recognisable and intriguing. There's a much greater sense of narrative and emotion in this cover. Frankly, I think it's awesome. The next stage in the onboarding process is learning the rules. Now, I can't fairly analyse the Big Adventure rulebook because I'm relying on a fan-made English translation. Regardless, the rule set is simple and clear. Each of the six dice results makes sense, and they're tied to the theme carefully, which makes the dice effect memorable. Of course Obelix is stronger than any Roman legion, and of course Asterix is equally strong once he's drunk his potion. It just makes sense. The rules to Caesar's empire, though, are another level of simplicity. This game is so stripped back, when I first read the rules, I wasn't sure that I hadn't missed something. On your turn, you place a token, you take a resource, and then you score. And rinse and repeat until the end of the game. And that's it. It's one of the simplest rule sets I've ever come across in a big box game. Several magnitudes easier than Ticket to Ride, a game which offers a similar network building experience. Pairing back the rules to this degree runs the risk of making the game simplistic and unengaging with limited choices. It's a tricky balance to get right. Let's see how the games fare on my engagement ladder analysis. I score games between 1 and 3 in 5 categories, and each point scored climbs them one rung up the engagement ladder. A score of 10 or above hits the highest rung and indicates a real favourite with me. For thematic immersion, neither game scores top marks. These are not simulations, they're very simple, abstracted games filled with nostalgic imagery. Caesar's silhouette peering over the board in Caesar's Empire is a highlight. But I really appreciate little things like the chosen resources in Big Adventure, the fish, the hammer, the harp, immediately recalling characters that we know and love. Big Adventure is packed full of references to the comics, and I love it for that. But it's never clear who we represent as players. Any player can benefit from rolling Asterix or Obelix, so who exactly are we supposed to be? Caesar's Empire is a little bit clearer. Each individual has a player board with an image of a Roman villain from the series, though nobody has any unique powers or abilities. The theme is certainly secondary to the mechanisms, but it makes good sense that we're overthrowing cities and connecting roads back to Rome. Regarding meaningful interaction, the two games start to diverge. Big Adventure has essentially zero interaction, except that a player might accidentally snap up a resource that you were hoping to collect before you have a chance to grab it yourself. Essentially, each player is playing their own game. Caesar's Empire, on the other hand, has tons of interaction. Every turn you'll gain rewards, but so will other players who share the route back to Rome. Even better is the game packed full of positive interaction. There's no take that here. Other players benefit when you take your moves, so it's simply a case of making sure that you're benefiting even more. All the fun of a stock market game with none of the complexity. Stress and challenge is not high in either game. There's always a degree of tension in dice rolling games, but there's so much you can do with the dice in Big Adventure that you're never really reliant on a particular dice roll. 
Caesar's Empire features no chance elements at all. It's a perfect information game. So the only tension is willing the other player to make a certain move which is beneficial to you, or hoping that they don't get to a desirable resource before you do. Feedback describes the manner in which a game responds to the player's decisions. Both of these games offer generous feedback constantly throughout the game. Successful turns of play are rewarded with plentiful rewards. In Big Adventure, that might be point-scoring Roman or pirate cards, coins to spend on a future turn, or resources to help players fulfil their objectives. In Caesar's Empire, every turn offers up victory points, as well as a city token and a resource. The feedback is even more substantial in Caesar's Empire because you frequently receive points on other players' turns. There's not a single moment of the game where you don't feel invested. Big Adventure scores 2 for feedback, Caesar's Empire scores 3. Meaningful decisions are a key component in most successful games, especially if they're going to hold your attention for more than a few minutes. And Big Adventure falls down here. The decisions are superficial. There's always plenty to do, and the decisions are dictated by the dice that you roll. You roll loads of wild boar, well, probably you want to go to the village and cash them in for victory points. Uh, you've rolled some obelix or asterix dice, well, you might want to use them to pick off one of the more challenging Roman cohorts. Caesar's Empire is quite the opposite. Considering the minimalist rule set, every turn offers up really challenging choices. If I connect to this city, I get the resource I need to complete my set, but am I setting up my opponent to reach a city that they desire? If I extend this road, it gets me one step closer to the numbered city that I require. But should I be heading for that coin to double my root score before someone else snaps it up? The game feels like it could have been designed by Rainer Knizia, with striking similarities to the decisions in his classics Through the Desert or Blue Lagoon. It's a very impressive design, achieving so much with so little. So the overall scores are a very mediocre 5 for Big Adventure and 11 points for Caesar's Empire. Under my ladder system, I do deduct points if a game is fiddly or if it gets in the way of itself in some form or other. I'm going to deduct one point from Caesar's Empire for excessive bookkeeping. After every player's turn, they need to collect two tokens, count up their coloured legions en route to Rome, as well as those of each of their opponents, and move each of the score markers along the track. It's not a huge deal, but when a turn entails simply placing a single plastic token onto the board, the amount of upkeep at the end of every turn feels a little bit out of balance, especially when playing at higher player counts. Nevertheless, the final score of 10 reaches the highest rung and demonstrates just what an engaging game Caesar's Empire is. Moving on to my product design checklist. Are the games innovative? No, neither of them really brings any new mechanisms to the table. I can't even really hail the role reversal of playing villain as truly innovative. Nonetheless, it still feels like a nice change of pace. Do the games fulfil a need? There have got to be more gamers out there like me, looking for a nostalgia fix in board game form. A quick Google search tells me that the most recent Asterix book, Asterix and the Griffin, had an initial print run of over 5 million copies. And the book series as a whole has sold approaching 400 million units, one of the highest selling book series of all time. But the lack of an English edition of Big Adventure, and the lack of any substantial coverage of Caesar's Empire in board game media thus far, makes me wonder how much of a crossover there really is with the board game audience. Do the games deliver on their promises? Yeah, an Asterix game ought to be light and breezy with nostalgic presentation, and both games provide this in spades. I'm not sure that I think the Pegasus game genuinely feels like an adventure. Surely pathing a few Romans, sinking some pirate ships, and catching wild boar is day-to-day -day stuff for our indomitable Gauls. Asterix is such a perfect theme for a board game. There's so many characters, so much light-hearted conflict, both violent and psychological. There's a lot of untapped potential in this property. And don't get me started on the lack of board games based on the other band Desene. Zero notable games about Tintin or my personal favourite Lucky Luke. Yet somehow we ended up with Witness, an extraordinarily innovative and exciting deduction game about Blake and Mortimer. No doubt a tremendous and influential comic, but hardly rivalling the best sellers in the market. Come on, publishers. Lucky Luke and Tintin books sell in their millions. That's got to be a market worth tapping into. But I digress. We're here to talk about Asterix, 
and all that remains is to plot the two games onto my idea execution matrix. Hit games tend to combine a fantastic concept with sharp execution, taking their place in the orange or red section, while weaker commercial products linger in the blue sections at the bottom left of the grid. Big Adventure is a rather predictable idea, but it makes sense. A simple dice game with plenty of cards and tokens depicting the wide cast of characters, items and locations from the series. The execution isn't strong. There are some nice touches in the design, especially those which perfectly marry the theme and mechanisms, but those elements are buried by the heavy reliance on chance, which renders the game insubstantial and forgettable. The central concept of Caesar's Empire doesn't bring anything new. Root building is a good model for an accessible board game, but it's hard to see another gateway title in this genre taking a substantial chunk out of Ticket to Ride sales. Fortunately, the execution on display in Caesar's Empire is outstanding, from the gorgeous cover art to the imposing silhouette of Caesar arched over the game board, the game looks lovely, and gameplay is brilliantly streamlined with engaging decisions and tons of interaction on every turn. Caesar's Empire deserves a lot more attention than it's getting, and I really hope it achieves decent sales, because Holy Grail games have dropped some intriguing hints about a potential expansion bringing Asterix and Obelix into the mix by Tutatis. If you enjoyed this video, please comment, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Until then, all the best.